Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. I'm Erica Richter. I'm the Vice President of Communications for the American Society of Travel Advisors. And it's my honor to welcome you to the National Press Club as we present the travel industry forecast from leading industry experts. We have over 200 media and guests streaming live online. Hello. If you want to turn around and say hello. Um, for those of you who are in the room, there are a lot of people who are watching live also from our Facebook. So if you would like to watch uh, this afterwards, Facebook's probably the best, quickest way to do that uh, after we wrap up here today. And I just want to say thank you to Derek, our, our tech team, uh, who's leading the way and up there in the broadcast studio. Everyone put a lot of work into this, so thank you very much for everyone who's helped. Um, so in this room, we have industry leaders, partners, supporters, our members of the American Society of Travel Advisors. And thank you all for being here with us today to support your National Trade Association. A few quick reminders for the media online. Some of the questions I did receive in advance. Uh, we'll, we're going to do our Q&A at the end. So please save all your questions for the end. And we'll also take some questions from those of you in the audience here if you have some. Uh, submit your questions if you're online through the webcast link. That's going to be the best, most efficient way that we can get to everybody's questions. Uh, and if you're watching through Facebook, we're going to try to get the comments questions, but the best thing you can do is just email pr at asta.org. So for any of the media who, who don't know how to get in touch with us, it's pr at asta.org. Um, and then, uh, so we're also going to send a copy of this research to our premium members. So that will happen in a few weeks uh, after we wrap up this event. So all of our premium members will get a copy of this presentation. And then, of course, the media as well. So a quick lineup. Uh, we're going to start with our president and CEO, Zane Kirby. And then we have Eric Dressen, Secretary General of the European Travel Agents and Tour Operators Association. He flew all the way here from Europe. So let's just give him a round of applause for that. <laughs> and, and he made it. So. Then we have John Last, president of Sports and Leisure Research Group. He's going to review some of ASTA's exclusive consumer research on travel trends and demand. And then we're going to conclude with a panel of experts, and they're going to give their perspectives on everything that we talk about earlier today. And that panel includes Matthew Upchurch, president and CEO of Virtuoso, Kareem George, principal at Culture Traveler and also ASTA board member, Kathra, Catherine Maza Bernie, Chief Sales Officer for Travel Savers. Mark Casto, President of Leisure Americas for Flight Center Travel Group, also the Chairman of ASTA's Board of Directors. Eric will also join the panel to give a European perspective in the discussion. And the panel will be moderated by Denise Jackson, President and CEO of Balboa Travel Management. So thank you all again for being here today. I know that uh, it's not easy to get places uh, right now. Things are a little chaotic, but we're going to address all of that, uh, all of the disruptions in our travel system, and so much more. Uh, we're really looking forward to delivering an informative program, and we hope that you enjoy. So I'm going to go ahead and welcome up our president and CEO, Zane Kirby. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. All right. Welcome to ASTA's, ASTA's annual <laughs> National Press Club event. This is the second time that we're meeting in the inner sanctum of, Amer of America's fourth estate. We're grateful that you've joined us here today. As Erica mentioned, my name's Zane Kirby. I'm the president and CEO of ASTA. Uh, though we have members in more than 100 countries, ASTA is primarily made up of 17,000 sellers of travel that are here in the United States. Um, ASTA's headquarters is across the Potomac River in Alexandria, Virginia. Now, 235, exactly, of ASTA's members from 47 states are in town this week for our annual legislative fly-in. The number of attendees and states represented are both records. Uh, the pandemic has obviously wreaked havoc on our business and livelihoods, and we're here this week to petition the government for redress. I'll share more on that in just a minute. But ASTA sponsors important research to help our members navigate market developments. We've conducted three different studies, two with ASTA advisor members and one external with travelers, uh, in the past few weeks. So the data is very fresh. John Last is going to share our consumer research findings, but I'm going to go over a few highlights from both studies. The first highlight is the amazing opportunity for our members and anyone thinking about joining our industry. It answers the question why big banks, such as J.P. Morgan Chase, recently entered the travel advisor business. They understand what the average consumer awakened to during the pandemic. 
One, that the desire to go and see and do is endemic to the human spirit. Two, that depriving people of that right and privilege only made them want it more. And three, and perhaps most importantly, traveling involves a complicated choreography of rules, schedules, and suppliers. The pandemic revealed and hardened these immutable facts, facts that increase the value of working with a professional travel advisor. Now, headlines over the weekend, more than 4,500 cancellations and over 10,000 delayed flights. Even the Secretary of Transportation's flight was canceled after meeting with airline CEOs. <laughs> Illustrate that travel demand is outpacing the industry's ability to supply transportation. The reasons are complicated, but for our airline partners, when cabin crew or equipment aren't available, we need more notice when cancellations are going to occur. Nearly 100 million Americans traveled overseas in 2019. U.S. domestic travel increased to a total of 2.3 billion in-person trips. According to the Commerce Department, travel was on a rocket ship-like trajectory prior to the pandemic, and post-pandemic is poised for staggering growth. Now, where does inflation factor into the, the travel's decision? Well, consumers' need for uh, travel has caused them to largely absorb the increased travel costs, and they are returning in numbers to, to the nation's skies and seas. In fact, they are spending more per person per day than in 2019 right now, and travel aggregate demand is still rising at double-digit rates. Now, John's going to cover this in more detail, but on the whole, consumers are sacrificing in other areas of their lives in order to travel. Now, over the past several months, ASTA has lobbied vigorously for the U.S. government to rescind its inbound testing requirement for vaccinated travelers. Other more cautious countries had already uh, done so. We had not. While the rule was in place, every COVID variant made, it, it made its way into the United States, and cases spiked to over 800,000 per day. Since the rule only applied to air travel, practical workarounds emerged. Those who ventured overseas from the United States flew back into Mexico or Canada and drove home. In a famous example, the New York Yankees flew to Toronto, Canada had already dropped their inbound testing requirement, for a three-game uh, stand against the Blue Jays, but then, not wanting to risk valuable players to a mandated prison-like quarantine, they drove back home to New York, flew to Toronto, drove back home. Finally, two weeks ago, the Biden administration rescinded the CDC's order. If you listen closely, you could hear a collective sigh from the travel advisor community and many, many travelers everywhere. The uncertainty created by inbound testing had wreaked havoc for months and months. Carefully planned trips have been postponed and canceled over and over again, creating more work and more headaches for our members. Now, other than Eastern Europe, given the dire situation in Ukraine, now that there is certainty that people will not be stuck abroad at their own expense, they can work with their trusted travel advisor to plan their overseas adventures, and they are. Demand from the U.S. to Western Europe, the Caribbean, and South America is already double-digit and extraordinary. Now, at its low point last decade, nearly 90% of consumers thought that they were travel professionals. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. They thought that the Internet offered them all they needed to make smart travel choices. Everything online glittered like gilded gold. But the pandemic underscored travel's complexity, not to mention that the internet doesn't return phone calls. If your mind wanders through the rest of my brief remarks, I want to leave you with this. A growing number of the traveling public understand the need for and value of working with a travel advisor. It's up over 45% right now. This goes back to the reason that we're in town this week. Our members are primarily female entrepreneurs of small businesses who charge planning fees and may receive a modest commission once a client has returned from their travels. Our members are the kind of earnest, hardworking people that politicians say they run for office to try and help. Well, it stands to reason that when the government regulations crafted and implemented in the name of public health simultaneously destroy an industry's livelihood, there is a moral obligation for the government to provide aid until the restrictions can be lifted and normal travel patterns can reemerge. Now, Abraham Lincoln observed something years ago that's still true today. He said this, quote, in this age, in this country, public sentiment is everything. With it, nothing can fail. Against it, nothing can succeed. End of quote. Well, asked a surveyed Americans, and the majority are with us in thinking that when government restrictions harm businesses such as ours, businesses where, where customers have to show up in person, 
the government has a moral obligation to make those businesses whole. We are taking that message up to Capitol Hill tomorrow. We hope our elected officials bring themselves into step with the will of the people. Now, ours is a global community. As mentioned, Europe is a, is a primary aspirational desperation for millions of Americans. We've invited Eric Dresden, the Secretary General of the European Travel, and Travel Agents and Tour Operators Association, to share an update on the travel business from across the Atlantic. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Eric Dresden. Thank you, Zan. Thank you. Can you hear me? It's correct? Okay. Perfect. I think I don't need this mic. Anyway, it's too tall for me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Zane and uh, Mark, for the invitation uh, when you were in Europe. And I think it proved to be a, a very good idea uh, because uh, we exchanged quite a lot this uh, last week. So I want to be short because um, there's some information that's very important, I think, the panel discussion afterwards. So what's the situation in Europe? And first, who we are, ECTA. ECTA is a, let's make it simple, the European ASTA. Uh, we are a European uh, entity, non-profit organization established in 61 at the very beginning of the European Economic uh, Community. Um, we have membership in, 20, in 32 countries, so not only European Union member states, but also Norway, Switzerland, and we have also um, Israel and um, Tunisia as, um, as a member of our organization. And of course, we are based in Brussels because you are based in Washington when it comes to, uh, to lobbying. Um, travel advisors in Europe, we approximately um, count 125,000 travel advisors, uh, employees um, half a million uh, of people. Um, in 2019, with the, the last normal year, the uh, turnover was uh, 800 uh, billion US dollars, um, selling 300 million tickets and um, packages, 200 million packages. So this is just to explain who we are. Um, just setting the scene now, um, we tend to look at our own region, but the situation is not uh, the same everywhere. So uh, if you look at the, the recovery worldwide, um, you see that the uh, America is doing quite well or better than the others. Uh, Europe is following, but um, there's a lot of improvement um, to still to happen. What is important in our view is that the trend is positive, it's accelerating. So we hope that the summer season will be even better and that quarter three will bring some um, less negative figure. Um, but the, the road was long. I'll bring some good news with me uh, from Europe. Uh, first is that uh, travel business is back. Uh, to put it uh, simple, it's not an easy business, but it's back. Um, we knew it's for leisure, but uh, the surprise is that it's also the same for business travel. Um, there's uh, recently a surge in demand for um, um, business meetings, and, um, and uh, companies are now ready uh, to send staff uh, abroad. If you look at um, domestic, uh, not domestic, uh, leisure travel, you see that um, the surge we mentioned, or you can use so in the first uh, uh, graph, is uh, replicated here. And what is very interesting is that the demand or the plans for travel in Europe is uh, this year bigger, more important than before COVID. So there is a need, you just mentioned that, and Zane, but there is a need for the people to, uh, to travel. Um, and this has been also uh, noticed when we had uh, the end of the lockdowns in 2020 and 2021. Um, immediately, you see a surge in demands. The other positive element is that it's not only one or two countries uh, where uh, citizens are interested to travel, but it's widespread all over Europe. So there is a, a, a demand and, and, and uh, a need for uh, going abroad. Um, talking about going abroad, uh, those figures show that um, people used to have in 2020, 2021, vacation in their own country, or it was the most preferred option, I would say. Um, you see that now the, they are ready to travel in another uh, country in Europe. Um, yet, the negative part, if I may say, looking at uh, the uh, US market, is that they will stay in the neighborhoods. So French will go to Spain or Italy, 
um, German to, uh, to Spain and Italy too, anyway. Everybody's going to Spain and Italy <laughs> on holiday. Um, um, so so n n no big plans to go abroad. And um, this is also very clear, and, and we'll come back at the end, because uh, international travel is not open as the European market. We are our own domestic markets. You have the US, we have EU as, a, as an entity. Now, I have some good news, I have also some bad news, uh, but I think in that uh, we replicate what uh, we see in the US. Um, inflation and uh, energy uh, prices have a big influence on the consumer uh, demand or mood. And you see that uh, this is the first reason not to travel this year. Um, this is a, a, real, a real element there. And uh, COVID is just going down to the th third, third rank. So um, our main issue in Europe today is to look at the options and the solutions we can bring to travel advisors to try to overcome this, uh, this aspect and, uh, and, uh, and try to help people also uh, to become um, convinced that they can travel. Um, a last element, uh, because being in Europe, we are closer um, to the Ukraine and, and the war in Ukraine. And um, as you can see, this is, this is not the main uh, issue for the European citizen. Um, certainly, if you're in Poland, Hungary, Romania, closer to the border, then you will have different figures. But a Portuguese person, an Englishman, um, a Norwegian will not look at uh, the war in Ukraine as a, a key element to make his decision uh, to travel or not to travel. So um, as a consequence, if I'm not traveling this year, it's because I don't have the money or I'm, I'm saving my money uh, because um, the price of energy uh, rose to an uh, unexpected uh, value uh, during the summer. The other bad news I have is that at least in Europe, I don't know how exactly in the situation in the US, but I've seen, heard that even the ministers are not protected uh, in, in, in their, um, in their um, transport. Um, we have a capacity crunch in Europe. Uh, nobody expected this rise in demand and airlines and airports uh, don't have the staff to um, manage that. So we have delays, we have uh, shortages, we have cancellation of flights to a point that uh, some airports are not demanding like Heathrow uh, airlines to cancel 10% of their flight for the summer season. Um, going to Cyprus uh, some weeks ago, a third of the uh, flights from UK to Cyprus, because this is a, a, a typical connection there, a third of the flights have been cancelled. Uh, this, this is a, a huge, huge problem. This is also a problem because travel organizers in Europe have other liabilities with their member, their customers, sorry, and um, they have to cover the financial damages. So the impact for travel advisors is even bigger. And last information I received this morning, um, I don't know if you have seen the uh, um, uh, situation in, in Schiphol in Amsterdam with people queuing outside. Our colleagues from the Netherlands um, just today mentioned that uh, they have seen a reduction of bookings departing from Schiphol by 25% the last week. So, I mean, I want to go on holiday. I don't want to queue for hours outside in the sun, so which is... I mean, understandable, but this is an impact for our members over there. And we are looking for some other information because the same happens in the in, uh, in UK. I'm here uh, because um, US market is also an important uh, market for European travel advisors. And um, in 2019, we have uh, 14.5 million trips coming from Europe to the US and the equivalent of 37 billion US dollars in value. Um, so it's really important. And you see that in 2022, even with positive uh, um, um, figures or positive trend, we are still below this, uh, this uh, previous figure. So 11 million trips for 20 billion euros, those are estimates. So we definitely need to work to make things back to normal, even better. And, um, and we need to coordinate activities. And I will uh, end my uh, presentation with these elements, going back to more uh, an organization uh, structure. Um, there's a lot of work and, 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 and joint activities we need to do 
Um, some things already have been achieved, so the end of the inbound testing rule, so thank you just before I arrive. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, well done. Um, at the same time, in Europe, we extended the uh, EU digital COVID certificates, which proved to be the very the excellent tool to help people travel. So this is something very important for us. Um, it means that next year, we don't need to have a new legislation. We just uh, extend uh, the element. What also we believe is important is the coordination between, between US uh, government and European Union on travel advice. Uh, because the message is uh, very uh, often not clear or um, contradictory, and we need to, to come over that. Um, at the same, we need to work together uh, for worldwide harmonization of the testing standards, um, because there's a lot of discrepancies there, um, and to help international travel to, um, um, let's say, to rebound, we need also to have an access to vaccine in less developed countries. We are well off. Uh, we could manage to have a free uh, vaccine from as regard uh, my, my staff in Brussels, but um, this has to be also uh, disseminated worldwide if we want to travel. On the long term, we also strongly believe in Europe, and that's a key element, and I will finish with that, is um, sustainable travel is the key element there. We need to have more sustainable uh, policies, company policies, governmental policies, meaning also that we need to have the finances for that, for sustainable fuels, for airlines, for instance, also for the promotion of sustainable destination. And we have a project with 700 SMEs in Europe, for us it's, sorry, it's never seen, um, trying to be trained and to better understand how they can um, identify sustainable suppliers for the customers. So this is a key trend. So if you want to market US for Europeans, market US as a sustainable destination. And with that, I will stop my presentation. Thank you for listening. And uh, John Last from uh, Sport and Leisure uh, Research Group will present the ESA consumer survey for this uh, summer season. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, everybody, for having me here today. Um, it's great to see so many people in person. Um, you know, one of the interesting byproducts of the pandemic is you meet a lot of people that you never get to see face to face. So it's good to kind of see that, yes, I am 6'2", not uh, just a half of one of them. We've been uh, honored to work with ASTA and a number of interests in the travel industry over the last, well, 14 years of our company, but particularly over the last two years. And one of the things that we have certainly been very much involved with is, is pulsing what the consumer is thinking. Obviously, to the point that Zane made just a few moments ago, whether we like it or not, perception is reality. So what people are thinking may not be necessarily reflective of what's going on, but by collectively looking at those perceptions, we get a really great understanding of what's driving our business and what can propel it further into the future. So with that very broad objective, we set out with ASTA to do what we call our Summer Consumer Travel Pulse, and I want to share with you in the next several minutes uh, a few of the key highlights from that, that that very well may be playing a significant role in where we've come from and certainly where we're going. As I said, from an objective standpoint, you know, really we wanted to get our arms around where people were as currently as possible. This, this research was conducted in mid to late May. Uh, and it's kind of a complement of, of a project that we've been blessed to work with over the last couple of years called the Back to Normal Barometer, which uh, many of you may have seen. This has, over the last 35 waves, it's kind of interesting, when we began the barometer back in, in March of, of, of 2020, I figured we'd do it, you know, three weeks, three, five weeks, you know, it'd be over with, why not? We're still doing the darn thing. Um, because even though, thankfully, COVID is really in the rearview mirror of most people, and that was one of the things we wanted to gauge, there are other exogenous factors that are certainly predicating people's behaviors and, and, and activities. And they're all very well known. We're going to kind of illustrate the magnitude of some of them right now, whether it's the impact of inflation, uh, whether it's some of the other inhibitors that, that is, as we've heard in our first two sets of comments, thankfully have been removed. I was happy to be on a flight actually when the mask mandate was lifted and watched my flight crew walk right down and say, if you want, you can take it off and right like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's good to see some of that going away, but there are obviously lingering impacts and we want to see what those are as we go forward. 
from a research perspective, um, I can geek out for those who want to. No one's ever in about 25 years of doing this taken me up on that with confidence intervals and you know, margins of errors, but I will suffice it to say that this is a representative sample of 515 US travelers. And to qualify as a traveler, this needed to be someone who had taken a trip with an overnight stay within six months of the pandemic or, or more recently than that. We, we, we wanted to get people who are actively in the category. Um, and from a statistical standpoint, it gives us a good level of confidence from a national basis. We break it up in lots of different ways, but the observations I'm going to be making today are more national in their scope. And as I mentioned, we did this in, in late May, uh, early part of, of the, or pretty much late May, right before the Memorial Day holiday. And as many have commented, and everybody certainly knows, the, the topic on everybody's mind is, is, is the cost of things and inflation. And one you know, number that just screams off the page, and we have from the barometer other charts that show the escalation of people's perceptions of the cost of things. At this juncture, 87% felt that consumer prices for consumer goods was either somewhat or significantly higher. That is pretty pervasive. So finding a silver lining to that cloud, when we go and look at travel in particular, it's not great, but it's better. 72% uh, perceive hotel prices to be somewhat or more expensive than it was pre-pandemic. You can see 78% on the airfare side and dining out really kind of on the top of that at 84%. This means that people are certainly seeing that increase, but you know, again, it's, it, these numbers and figures are all lower than what they have observed for consumer goods on the whole. And as a number of the earlier comments alluded to, the good news as we kind of go through it is that people aren't holding back. And despite these prices, we are still seeing these bars represent the percentage of Americans who say they are actually spending more on each of these categories. So two things to pull from this slide that I think is really salient for you to think about. On the one hand, travel, people who are spending more on travel or they're spending more on it than any of these other categories. So to a comment that I always remembered, I believe, if I'm crediting it correctly, it was Jim Rizzullo, who was at Disney at the time, once said that travel is seen as a birthright. And it is. 45%, despite all of these headwinds economically, are spending more on travel. Now, if you want to be a half-empty person, which I'm not, there are a bunch of other people that you know, are obviously the confluence of that. So it, we, we have some ways to go. But the good news is that relative to other discretionary purchases, this category is rebounding in a, in a meaningful way. And it's not going to go away either. When we ask people about what their plans were for 2023, uh, a similar 41% in the statistical parlance, this is an identical number, even though it's a couple of points lower, um, said that they plan to spend somewhat or a lot more on leisure travel in 2023. So that's also a really good sign. Eric shared some figures from Europe. Here's what we're looking at domestically in terms of people's plans for the balance of the year. Um, two-thirds planning leisure travel before the year's end. Um, two-thirds planning specifically for um, the holidays, or half, rather, for the holidays. The 23% number is an interesting one. I know the panel is going to talk about the rebound of business travel in, in just a few minutes. This is the percentage of people who say that they will travel for business out of everybody. So you have to recognize that there's a large percentage of people who don't travel at all for business. I can say, and I know the, the panel has some, some really great information from their day-to-day -day work to speak to this, but I can say that we have seen in some of our other work the incidence of business travel going up. Um, and interestingly, the major inhibitor that we saw when we asked people about that in some of our other work has been more their company's hesitance to spend in that particular way. So that seems to be, from what we've been observing, the, the larger issue, and certainly I'm anxious to see what the panel may have to say about that. Where are they going? Um, the usual suspects domestically uh, tend to fall on the list. This is, again, when people were asked where they plan to go. Over the next six months, you can see the, the Las Vegas, Orlando, New York, Nashville, and LA kind of round out the top five, uh, a number of other usual suspects that are on there. Um, feel free to take a picture of the slide. I know it's being shared with everybody. I don't like to read each of the lines on the slide, per se. We're also seeing a really positive look at where things may be going for international travel. 
um, in, in, in asking people's plans both for the balance of 2022. You can see that just under four in 10 plan to travel internationally uh, during the balance of this year, and that number goes up significantly to 49%, nearly half, who are expecting and eager to travel internationally next year. Where they will be going when they uh, go internationally, again, perhaps not a big surprise to see Western Europe, the Caribbean, and Mexico uh, being the preponderant and, and most uh, likely places that people are looking to travel. Uh, a little bit of breakout there from people on different age groups. Shows not a really huge variation based on people's age uh, and where they want to go. The hierarchy is still pretty much exactly the same in terms of what their preferred international destinations will be. Diving a little deeper into the international travel front, these are our top 10 cities that people are looking to, to visit uh, when they travel internationally. So something certainly that travel advisors uh, can actively expect to be involved in uh, as they navigate those next great adventures for, for US leisure travelers. And those adventures are certainly something that people covet. We, we ask people uh, from an agreement standpoint, um, are you planning to take a dream vacation within the next six months? And, and as you can see here, that comparing that to a number of other potential bucket list type uh, items or, or other aspirational leisure pursuits, taking a dream vacation is, is number one, more so than buying a, a better or new vehicle, remodeling their homes, buying an expensive consumer item, or, or buying a second home. And I think a really positive thing, obviously we all covet those younger travelers who become uh, greater in terms of lifetime value. Um, a higher index of those, 39% of those age 35 or younger, who are also looking for that dream vacation. Uh, people want to get up and get out. They're tired of being cooped up uh, over the last couple of years. And, and that really illustrates itself in this next uh, statistic, which I really was fascinated by. We asked people, do you need a vacation? Is it good? You know, will it do, what will it do for your mental health? And on a scale of 1 to 10, 80% of the people said 8, 9, or 10, yes, a vacation would do wonders for my mental health. And we had some other questions that validate that as well. So the, the idea of getting out there and experiencing life is something that people really covet. Uh, and again, we have other data from other work that, that really illustrates that. We've done some qualitative research for some other clients where, you know, you just you can see and feel the emotion of people's liberation, if you will. We actually tracked a statistic in the barometer that we called COVID liberation moments, which was that one, that seriously, this was, you know, this is what we came up with. I, I'm a creative as well as a geeky researcher. Um, and this was the moment in time where people felt that they finally had gotten their pre-pandemic lives back. Now, the bad news is a lot of people still haven't, but the, mar the demarcation point for a lot who had was when they were able to travel and go somewhere. So what are those priorities? Diving into that a little bit further, we asked people to indicate you know, what they want to see from travel. Um, a couple of select things here. Um, the whole idea of unique experiences, planning something that is different, that is special, that is customized for them, which certainly plays right into the hands of what travel advisors do. Um, interestingly, and I'm sure the panel is going to talk about this, another topic welling you know, certainly near the top of the, of the surface is the whole areas of customer service and half want more of it. And unfortunately, we all know in practice that's not necessarily happening. I think we can all share our nightmare stories, um, but we've also tracked it, and one of the things that is still fairly disturbing across a number of categories is that people are underwhelmed when they think about the experience that they're having relative to their recollections of that experience pre-COVID. It is not universally meeting those expectations. We know that there's exogenous factors that are hurting that, um, but it is a real reality that we need to be mindful of in setting expectations and also in hopefully elevating things. Uh, in some separate work that we've done about uh, the COVID job market, we all know and we can quantify that the leisure and hospitality sector continues to be severely hit by people leaving that uh, sector and also not wanting to come back, which uh, is, is definitely a challenge. That said, you know, perhaps because of whether it's the COVID liberation moments or the certain comfort the preponderance of people do want to, uh, you know, this 48% is those who, this is what their priorities are, to return to a favorite place. And a separate question, um, the majority of people actually will prefer to go back to somewhere they've been before rather than somewhere new. So that comfort zone certainly plays a role. I talked about back to normal. Um, again, kind of half empty, half full. We are not there yet. Um, in terms of people saying that, you know, looking at their own experiences, how close are each of these different activities or places to being back to pre-pandemic normal? The great news is that hotels and resorts are, are right there near the top of the list across these other activities. Um, the opportunity for a half-full person like myself is that there's still some ways to go. 
And um, again, these numbers taken in static for this particular study can certainly be mapped against some of the barometer data that we've done, and these have climbed really significantly in recent months. So that is a good positive sign. And to some extent, again, people kind of looking at it from the standpoint that they just want to get out. There's a little bit more leeway in terms of people's willingness and empathy as to what the situation is. Similarly, another issue that certainly is at the top of the news and plaguing people is the cost of gas and what that may have in an impact in terms of U.S. summer travel in this year. What I love about this is the 23%, is the nearly a quarter, people that really just say, nothing's stopping me. I'm getting out there. I don't care how high uh, gas prices are going to be. Uh, more pragmatically, uh, the impact of it is still somewhat to be determined, uh, by, as you can see by the other figures. Um, people may reduce the number of trips. They may travel closer to home. Um, some are kind of taking a wait-and-see attitude, but you know, you got a quarter that they're going no matter what. Zane made a point earlier that I also want to emphasize, and from a professional sector standpoint, what you provide, what the travel industry provides to the U.S. is not lost on consumers. As you can see on these three figures, these are the percentage of people, um, we're talking about nearly three quarters or more, who strongly recognize that travel is absolutely vital to the overall economic recovery of this nation. 79%, nearly 8 nearly eight in 10, think that it's an important driver of the U.S. economy, uh, and nearly three-quarters seeing it a critical element of trade, as well as both an import and an export. Think about that phenomenon. Travel is an import and an export and plays a huge role in our overall economy, and the overwhelming majority of consumers, travelers, believe that strongly. And I want to close with, with one last slide that, that hopefully the travel advisors in the room will find comforting as well. As, as we know, one of the things that really emerged during the pandemic was that people needed to feel in control. That was one of the biggest things that was, was driving it in all the interviews we did and the research the surveys that we did. They recognized that even with the lifting of certain restrictions, we have seen a foundational change in, in the way people go about activities. And with that, they recognize that travel has become more complex and they recognize that travel requires more guidance. So you can see here, um, the, the stat that, that Zane put up there, nearly half strongly agreeing that they're more likely to use a travel advisor. That is a very encouraging sign. It's an opportunity for this profession to continue to assert its expertise, to give people back that control that they need to get back out there and navigate this new environment that we are in very safely and, and very effectively. So lots more behind the, the, the door on that one that we certainly can make available through ASTA. Um, I thank you again for the opportunity to be here, and I want to bring up now a group of folks that are living this day to day. You know, it's one thing for me to sit in my ivory tower, even though I fly over 150,000 miles a year, so I don't really sit in an ivory tower, but as researchers, you're, you know, you're kind of looking at this stuff in aggregate to some degree. This next group of esteemed uh, industry experts live it day to day, and I know they have some very specific uh, stories to share and, and perspectives to share. I want to bring up Denise Jackson, who's going to bring up her panel and introduce them. And I think the next uh, several minutes you'll find to be very entertaining and lively uh, with their firsthand perspective. So thanks again for the opportunity to queue it up. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. That's right. We're going to be a fun panel. <laughs> We need our sunglasses. <laughs> Just makes us sweat a little more <laughs> because we haven't done that for the last two and a half years. Um, I'd like to take a moment and uh, introduce myself. I'm Denise Jackson. I'm the president and CEO of Balboa Travel, headquartered in San Diego. And in today's format, not only will I be the moderator, but I will be somewhat representing corporate travel, the TMC sector, as well as uh, meetings and incentives. That's what our company specializes in, in addition to corporate travel, and of course, we handle leisure. So I'd like to take a moment and have the panel introduce themselves, but before then, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you to all of you who have survived the last two and a half years, and you're exhausted, and the party's just getting started. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you to Asta, who's been with us every step of the way, fighting our fight. It's our fight, and they've done us amazing job and I think the turnout today those of you streaming in that perhaps didn't make it because your flight was canceled um, <laughs> will remember ASTA in their time of need when they ask us for some additional support so without further thank you. so 
so our panel's amazing. Look at them, don't they look good? First off, they look great, right? <laughs> So we're gonna start with some brief introductions, and we're gonna start with Catherine. And not only do I want you to tell me about yourself, okay. but we'd like one piece of advice for anyone planning a trip anytime soon. Anything that you can hand your gift to them today. Ah, oh. well, first and foremost, good morning. Um, I was one of those with that casualty yesterday. Actually, we were delayed and delayed. Uh, I was with Tara, and then when we got here, we had to kind of take back off a little bit because there was a VIP landing, so we could not land. Um, but good morning, I'm Catherine Mazaburney, and I am Chief Sales Officer at Travel Savers, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, we are headquartered in beautiful Oyster Bay, New York, um, and for anyone that does not know much about our business, we have been around for 52 years. We are a generational family-owned business. Um, and thanks to ASTA for all you're doing, um, we hope to be around for the next 52 and beyond. So thank you very much for all you've done for the independent travel agents. We greatly appreciate it. Um, so I was asked, actually, yesterday, so I'm going to go with it, um, where my last international trip was, and then what advice I can give. So okay. I am. Um, Travel often, I've been around Europe quite a bit, but my last trip was actually with Robin, and I was in uh, the Guadalupe Valley in Mexico. So for anyone who doesn't know where that is or how to get there, you need to fly into San Diego and cross the border in Tijuana. Um, it was interesting, because I've never done it before. Um, so for anybody, my advice would be for anybody crossing the border in Mexico, your global entry cards, make sure you have that, um, land option checked off, because many of us did not. And what should have taken a half an hour to get through, it took us five hours to get through. So note that. <laughs> but we did make it across, and um, my next global entry will have the, the <laughs> land portion on it. But it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And next, I know you already heard all of the amazing uh, facts from Eric. But Eric, if you could take a moment and reintroduce yourself and then share with us, I guess we might be your last international destination, I'm not sure, <laughs> getting here. And some advice for any of the people in the audience today. Thank you. So um, I, I'm not a travel advisor uh, by profession. I'm working in Brussels in the European affairs, so I'm a lobbyist, if I may say. And um, I would describe my job as uh, an expert in opening doors. It mean, I mean by that that um, I try to find the right moment, the right person, the right topic. And uh, then I gather travel advisors or national associations to be with me and to deliver the right speech because they are the one who knows exactly what the business is. So basically I'm, I'm opening doors every day of the week. I'll try. <laughs> um, Looking at uh, the last international travel, uh, we resumed quite a lot of travel in Europe uh, the, last, uh, the last month. And um, it was not the last one, but uh, I've been to Greece um, in May. And I think, and I wouldn't advise, uh, not a technical one, but I've been surprised by the commitment of the Greek government to promote this country as a year-round destination. Um, and um, they have um, proposed some really hidden gems in northern part of the countries, of the country, and um, I really would uh, advise you to have a look, a closer look at uh, northern Greece, because you have a, a, different, uh, a different destination there, and, uh, and by the way, you're going to Europe, which is also a nice experience. So I, will, I would say go to northern Greece. Okay, got that? <laughs> Kareem, same Good. question. Good morning, everyone. Kareem George. I'm the principal of Culture Traveler. We're a full service agency based in Franklin, Michigan, suburb of Detroit. And we represent uh, the thousands of independent contractors and small business owner members that are part of ASTA. And most recently, I traveled to South Africa, one of my favorite destinations, a beautiful country. And my advice would be to make sure you have your digital vaccine. It's not a suggestion, it's absolutely mandatory. Uh, it's something you can do through the Clear app. It's something you could do through a variety of other online tools, but make sure you're prepared uh, with that information before you travel. Thank you. Matthew. Hi, I'm Matthew Upchurch. I'm the chairman and CEO of Virtuoso. And uh, I turned 60s this year, and I had a very contemplated moment because 
Um, I'm here because I had a really, really good fortune when I was 24 years old to meet a group of travel advisors who'd started an organization in 1950 called Allied Travel. And they were a, a group of independent agencies that came together to do one of my favorite definitions of leadership, which is to do something together you couldn't do alone. Um, and I think about what we do at ASTA and everything else, how this industry is pulled together. I'm incredibly proud of what ASTA has done and, and what this industry has shown the resilience. So I'm, I get the privilege of representing a lot of incredible entrepreneurs that I've spent the last 36 years of my life hanging out with. Um, <laughs> and it's been amazing. Um, so for me, my, actually, there's a lot of practical. I'm not a travel advisor as well. I represent them. I always, I always say to them that I'm the Hollywood agent. They're the stars. I'm, the, I'm a, you know, my job is to put a, a, a spotlight on them. But to me, one of the, I think, all these different logistics and things like that, they're all very important. Um, but I think for me, I just go back to something I've said for a while. Why would somebody use and have a wealth advisor to have a conscious plan to optimize their money, but not have somebody in their life to build a conscious plan to optimize their most valuable non-renewable asset, their free leisure time? So I just keep saying the same thing I've been saying a long time is that you can do all those logistics, but the best thing you can do for your travel experiences is actually have some sort of a framework of a plan. And a lot of really great travelers and great advisors have been doing something for a long time that I see happening more and more. Remember when you're in the fifth grade? I think it was the fifth grade. Remember that, sci that science teacher you had that had a jar and there was rocks, pebbles, and sand? And it was a, a, an exercise in volume and it says all this can go in the jar, right? But it only goes one way. And you had to put the rocks in and then the pebbles and shake it around and put the, the sand in it. And that's what we're seeing a lot of great, uh, I think, travelers doing today that are being successful with having better experiences is that they're looking at what are their big, their big plans. And so right now you're seeing cruise ships selling out 2024, 2025. I mean, things like that, right? So I think that's, that'd be my number one advice is if you have a wealth management plan, you should have a life experience plan. Thank you, Matthew. Mark. I hate following Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting back and thinking about what was my fifth grade and evolved baking soda and vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> Your teacher was much better than mine. Man. Uh, Mrs. Dunn, if you're watching. <laughs> I'm Mark Casto. I'm president of Leisure Americas for Flight Center Travel Group which is encompasses a number of brands uh, incorporating Liberty Travel, GoGo, -Go, um, uh, independent uh, by Flight Center, independent by Liberty, Student Universe, and Flight Center. Um, so I have had the opportunity of spending plenty enough time over the last few months on a plane or in a hotel or in a rental car or the like. And my advisement for people is when you actually do try to get away, um, as I was in Cancun last week with some of our team, actually block off your calendar so people stop booking appointments on your calendar so you can actually get to the beach that you went to and you're not stuck in the meeting room all day long on Zoom calls um, when you really would prefer to be anywhere else. We've done enough of that. Thank you, Mark. I would, I would only add my own two tips. Have patience and a backup plan. And if you don't have one, think to tell your clients that or your own family. Remember the patience thing first. You'll have to go to back to that about 15 times during the trip, so. Okay, so we've all seen the headline news. USA Today is calling it Travel Armageddon this past weekend. I renamed it Armageddon. Sorry, our airline partners, we love you though. Thousands of flights, as Zane pointed out, have been canceled over the weekend and even our Secretary, Department of Transportation Secretary couldn't get home. So we want to chat a little bit about that and perhaps some of you that are streaming weren't able to make it, um, but that's okay. Four hours sometimes in an airport is too long. I'd like to ask the panel what their take is on it and I want to start with you, Mark. What do you make of all of this? And what's your best advice to travelers who have plans for this summer? Sure. Uh, U.S. Mar market, obviously. Uh, uh, thank you, Denise. Uh, Armageddon, I think, is a good name for it, but I'm wondering if Bruce Willis will show up at some point during the course of it. Uh, so in terms of what do I make of it, I'd like to coin a new acronym, and it's called uh, WTHIE. 
also known as where the hell is everyone? <laughs> Every single service sector we, we know of, from hotels, airlines, to car rental firms across the, the main, is suffering from the same problem, which is a lack of labor, insufficiency of labor. We ourselves are scrambling to find any labor. The labor markets have completely upended over the last few years, and it's going to take quite some time to reconcile during the course of that. In conversations with airlines, I know that they're trying to onboard hundreds of uh, pilots per, per month, uh, per week, per day if they could, but that requires a significant amount of training to get them up in the speed. Unfortunately, fortunately, we can't grab somebody off the street and put them in front of a plane and have them fly. Um, I would have tried, but that would have ended tragically, and none of you would want to be on that plane. So my advice to travelers, though, is the same advice I always have, um, which is why would you bother checking luggage? Uh, that is a surety to confirm that you will never see that luggage again, uh, or, and just will upset the trip. So if it's absolutely essential, obviously for us, you get lots of equipment to have, which is very valuable, uh, probably best to ship it in advance if possible. Thank you, Mark. Matthew. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we can be incredibly empathetic, but there, there is this, this idea that, you know, the airline industry did receive $56 billion worth of aid. And I'm just kind of understanding, and we're, you know, we represent the traveler. And I want to maintain, you know, it's not easy, it's empathetic, but there's some accountability here to, to be had for both us and for the traveler. So I think that's one of the things. Um, but I also think that one of, the other, one of the other things that the pandemic has done in the overall service sector is we have to have a better way. We've got to be more inventive in the way that we merchandise these jobs, um, the way in which we present them. Um, and I think companies have to be much more agile in the way they're going to engage their, uh, their team members and employees um, and in the way that, that, that we as an industry have to position this. I mean, because at the end of the day, any evolved economy becomes a service economy. And if you don't figure that one out, you're going to have you're going to have a lot of a lot a lot of issues. Thank you, Kareem. Yeah, this is such a challenging environment, but it's not one where you have to be alone. So there's a community of travel advisors out there to assist. Uh, we're trained to assist, and even myself, when I travel, I have a team behind me. So remember that this community knows these destinations. They know the air lift in and out of the destinations. They know how to best craft your itinerary so that you have some cushion, so that you have, the, you have some margins. That's the term I like to use these days is margin. So you have space before and after the departure to account for things that may happen. And there are ways to choose your flights. There are ways to pace your flights. There are ways to pace the trip. And we're all here with that information to assist you. So don't, don't do it on your own. When you're not working with an advisor, you are on your own. And there's a trained community here to help. So, so let us assist you. Uh, keep your, your family and friends involved to be aware of your travels, because really it's a, it's a team effort these days with uh, folks traveling to multiple destinations multiple times. So we really need, just all need to work together uh, to manage this temporary situation. It'll, it'll get better, but right now we just, we're not going to stop traveling, and we have to figure out the way to make the most of it. Thank you, Kareem. Eric, you'll have the European perspective. Yeah, I think this is not uh, only a problem in, uh, in, in the US. We uh, just explained we have the same situation in Europe. It's not, airlines is an issue, airport is also an issue. Um, a shortage of uh, labor force is, is everywhere. And for sure, we don't have a solution for the coming weeks. Uh, training, recruiting, training, uh, and organizing all this it will take time. So the summer will be, in our perspective, problematic, if I may say. Um, and we are just wondering uh, and having a discussion with other organizations at EU level, if we cannot invite airlines, airports, to, to clarify what the offer will be for the summer, not to sail uh, planes that will, or flights that will not uh, depart, uh, and, and uh, reducing the offer by uh, X percent, because we know at the end that uh, we'll, have, we'll have issues there. Better prevent that uh, fine solution afterwards. Thank you. Catherine. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Denise, at first. Um, pack your patients um, and definitely have a backup plan. Um, we are seeing, I mean, look at what just happened at a major airport in uh, the United States this past weekend. Um, their capacity it closed their doors. It wasn't allowing people in to catch their flights, so they were missing their flights. Um, work with the consumer. 
insurance is extremely important trip <laughs> interruption. Um, they need to take it. You know, those that are traveling on the leisure side, many of them are connecting um, to go on to destinations. Many of them are going on to cruises. Um, plan a day ahead, leave a day ahead. Um, don't necessarily leave the day of. Um, I've done that a few times where I've missed the ship and had to fly to these obscure places because I missed the ship. So the advisor or, or the, the consumer um, needs to understand that there's a lot going on at these airports today. Um, plan accordingly. Thank you. I think that's, that's an excellent point. And in some cases, I would say beyond one day. Because if you, any of you are advisors and you're, you're looking in our systems that we use to book, you can see those zeros across the board. So if something's missed, the likelihood of being reaccommodated shortly thereafter in the same day is slim to none, and sometimes for days after. So plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. OK. So we, we've seen the data presented by both Eric and John. You're all living it every day as it relates to the surge coming back. Some people are calling it revenge travel. They want revenge on the pandemic. Um, call it whatever, whatever you will. Um, I myself went through the same thing of I'm going to spend, I don't care how much money to go on a trip. And it was to Europe just a few weeks ago. And I said it was worth every penny, although I had to have patience because I still fell within that uh, testing coming back into the United States and we did lose a person off of our trip as it related to being quarantined and I know some of you have experienced that. So I'd like to ask the panel, what do you think is driving the surge? You know, Give us some perspective on the travel rebound and do you think it will last? I mean, statistically, we've seen the presentations, it sounds like it's going to last and we've got to get prepared for it and build that infrastructure back. But what are your thoughts? Captain, I'm going to start with you. So revenge travel, it's a real thing. Um, that pent up demand, people have been sitting in their homes for two and a half years. They've been saving their money. They've been dreaming about travel. Um, it's time to get out there and travel. The preferreds, our preferred partners, our suppliers are making it very enticing for the consumer to travel. They're putting out some amazing, amazing promotions. Um, we're seeing the surge. You know, the phones are ringing. Um, we're seeing it in so many different segments of our business. You know, there are certain segments, such as the fun and sun FIT side, we're seeing triple digit growth. Um, it's real. You know, our premium and luxury, we're seeing double digit growth. Um, we have seen a little bit of a softening on the contemporary side, but we believe it's just a blip and it will continue to, to increase. And then Europe, um, it's hard for us right now to measure, um, especially since the rescinding of the, the uh, testing, thank goodness. Um, but the phones are ringing, so it's a good sign. There is definitely interest there. Um, do I believe it will continue? Um, our 23 and 24 numbers look fabulous. Um, do I think eventually it will level off? I do, um, but I don't see that any time in the near future. And I'll keep my fingers crossed. You're seeing crossed. it as pent-up demand. Absolutely. OK. Great. Thank you. Eric, you have more holidays than any of us in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying that I'm jealous, but <laughs> there in, is there any room? I, I, I saw the percentages up there, that everything's up, and you guys are staying close to home. How is that even possible with all of, all of us invading you, particularly this summer? <laughs> Where are you guys going to go with all of us taking the hotels? Well, um, let's be pragmatic. You have an invitation to go to an Asta event, for instance. Oh. So <laughs> you, you take the first plane to, to cross the Good Atlantic and, and, and be in Washington instead of, of uh, having uh, all the guests, in, uh, American guests in Europe. But no, um, there is definitely uh, an increase uh, of the demand, long lasting for sure. Um, the percentage difficult to say. We don't have crystal ball. Um, we, um, I'm not a psychologist, but I think um, we can explain from our own perspective. We are social uh, human beings. We need interaction. So um, um, we need to have uh, travel is part of a modern of model of society and, and model of uh, model of life. Um, so this on the leisure it will stay. And also there's a lot of um, you know Europe is the top world destination, so there's a lot of uh, investment also uh, to promote that uh, in, in Europe for European customers. 
Um, the other thing um, is also discussing with the, the, the mice sector. Um, we see that um, we, we had the question, will Zoom, all these new technologies, kill this kind of business problem? And um, you see a reaction of these organizers by enhancing, enhancing this, the offer they, are, they have uh, on place. So exhibition will be different um, and there will still be exhibitions. So there are all good reasons to say that uh, it will, this will stay. And the question will be the percentage at the end, but uh, there is a demand there. Thank you. And Kareem, in addition to answering the question, can you talk a little bit, since you're right there on the line with your team, you know, not only do we have this revenge travel, but what are you seeing in terms of the type of travel? Any sort of mix that you can share with us? Okay, sure. So despite the challenges, this is really, I think, and our travelers think, a great time to travel because there are opportunities they're seeing. Despite inflation, they're seeing that their dollar is nearly on par with the euro. They're looking at other destinations that have currencies that are undervalued, that are bucket list destinations where they can really go and have some extreme value. They're also realizing that we're still reopening now, so they're not encountering the crowds in certain destinations. So despite the challenges, there's a lot of opportunity, and they're seeing this as a great opportunity to do these multi-generational trips that they've been putting off or that they've missed, and they're refusing to miss them. So they're saying, my 50th anniversary, I'm not missing that. We're doing the 52nd as the 50th, and we're going to make it happen. Uh, graduation parties. This is graduation season, but it was graduation season the past two years. Right. And a lot of our travelers have made plans with their families, and their kids have had dreams of places they want to see that they've studied, and they've, they've planned accordingly to do that. Uh, we're also seeing honeymoons. Weddings are finally starting to happen. Again, in our country with venues reopening, but people looking at destination weddings as an opportunity, again, with inflation domestically, we're getting a lot of inquiries. Can I have my wedding in Mexico? Can I have my wedding in Costa Rica? Can I have my wedding in Europe? So really, this is a time where people are so pleased to get together again. Uh, they're really finding this as a moment to celebrate and to support these local economies that are welcoming them with open arms. Sure, there are staffing challenges, but when you get to these destinations, and we've all traveled, there really is an appreciation to see the American traveler back. And there really are still hotels that are getting it right, and service standards are not low across the board. You, you'll often be very impressed with the warmth and hospitality you receive. So I think it's a great time to travel, and many of our clients are seeing it as an opportunity that they're taking advantage of. Matthew? When it, is there anything to add, or did Kareem say it all? No, very. <laughs> Kareem, that was fantastic. Also, I agree with Eric about we're social animals. It's the only reason we ex exist as a species. Um, my favorite line during the pandemic was, uh, disruptions accelerate trends. And boy, this is <laughs> the biggest disruption we've ever had, right? And when you say disruptions accelerate trends, they accelerate it both on the upside and the downside. And what's really interesting is that all the fundamental reasons that made 2019 the, the largest history, you know, amount of travel in the history of the planet, none of those fundamentals went away at all. Um, the pandemic did not stop me from turning 60. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so you had two, the two underpinning fundamental uh, drivers of, of travel have been the, uh, the fact that when the last baby boomer turns 60 in 2024, that will be the first generation in the history of the planet where 80% of the entire generation is expected to live an additional generation, 20 to 25 years. We've always had 80 year olds in the world. We've just never had as many as what we're about to see. And of the 80% that survive, 80% of those in relative health. So you have the longevity revolution and so you have, for example, within the multi-gen world, you have the whole idea of skip gen, which is inside the multi-gen, which is the grandparents taking the grandkids and leaving the parents behind. So the longevity revolution and the fact that we've also never had um, what is now six generations of people all traveling at the same time in the numbers that they're traveling today. And then the other thing that accelerated, and you can see this by the entry of LVMH, the Caring Group, 
and everybody else, lifestyle brands, luxury brands, whatever, getting in the experiences. The other is the acceleration of the prioritization of spending on experiences rather than on physical goods. And so that's been something that's been coming, but it's just got, so I, I, I see the pandemic as, you know, of course it dates me, right? Mario Kart, who plays Mario Kart anymore? <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, tonight, 10 p.m. <laughs> But remember in Mario Kart where when you're driving, all of a sudden there's that, that, if you put it right on the right part of the track, it was a turbocharge. That's exactly what the pandemic has done. I mean, it's just been like a slingshot, right? Um, but I have to tell you one of my favorite things. She was a little bit early, because it was still early in the pandemic, but one of my favorite lines. I was at a place in California, October of 2020, and this little health place, and, and this lady, you know, you find out, it is good to be in travel, right? Because you're not selling insurance. People want to talk to you. So they find out what you do. They well, you kind of are. People, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but people are just talking about you. And, 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 and she says, after she realized what I did, she goes, well, you better tell your advisors that they better eat their Wheaties and get ready because when I'm ready to travel, they're not going to, they're going to see. And by the way, we're all feeling it now, right? And I love what she goes because I tell you what, at the end of the day, there's so much, so much, there's only so much furniture and so much wine I can buy. <laughs> How are you, Mark? <laughs> Who put me here in this lineup? <laughs> Denise? Okay, sorry, to, Mark. to continue sorry. your analogy, um, in Mario Kart, uh, in order to take that offering, <laughs> a critical thing is to get that little magic mushroom that, that brings oh, yeah. you forward. And, We've definitely been having to consume some of those who survived the last few months for it. <laughs> Good segue. Yeah. All so thank right. You, thank you. Um, I'm not condoning eating magic mushrooms. I leave that up to yourself. The, I, I do believe that the uh, travel will continue to rebound during the course of it because there's at least three major populations that have not actually started traveling again. Um, first and foremost is corporate travel has only really been uh, re-entering back into the fray over the course of the last couple months. And we're going to see a massive resurgence over that as we exit from the summer time frame. We'll back to more uh, historic normalities towards it. The second population is the unvaccinated. Um, that has been restrained uh, for one reason or the other towards the ability to exit from it. And the third is the one that I think is it's a little bit more uh, hidden from us, which is China hasn't reopened. Yeah. Exit China, outbound China is a massive, massive market for all the different spaces. And the impact upon that when that does eventually reopen will have an uh, extraordinary impact upon the rest of the travel industry, which will continue the acceleration of all of those trends. Thank you, Mark. And just to add on to the corporate statistics, I would say from a TMC perspective, we're, I've, I've talked to many TMCs at a lot of conferences recently. I would say everybody's averaging somewhere between 60 to 70 percent of their 2019 numbers. And that's predominantly still U.S. travel, but international markets have opened up. And if you're representing any of that market, you also need to think about the corporation themselves. They are in shock with what's happening with airfares and, and travel expenses overall. They had no problem spending their vacation money and doing going through the moon, but when it comes back to the reality of they haven't paid for that for the last two and a half years, mm -hmm. you're really gonna have to have your team sit down and work with them through the budgeting process for the next couple of years. So they are aware of what's coming and that they put it in their budgets. And I would say the other piece of it is the meeting and incentive side. Mm -hmm. We're seeing double digit growth, very high growth in that area. And I'm not sure what's happening and why the C-level teams are deciding that they want to pull their entire population together in two weeks. It's just insanity. And I'm sure you're all experiencing the same thing. So um, I'm also told we, we don't have time for all of our questions, so I'm going to get to just two quick ones. One, um, obviously, thanks to ASTA and uh, all of you, we talked about the order being rescinded for the uh, testing coming back into the United States for those that are vaccinated. How do we navigate through the complexity of that? Because that doesn't mean it's just easier to travel just because that's taken off. There's still an intense complexity, and in every country there may still be a different type of rule that we have to deal with, which Kareem is absolutely right. Use your travel advisors. Mm -hmm. They're your experts. They're going to have the most updated information. They, they're not required to have it all in their head, but they have access to it. So bear that in mind. Any quick thoughts on that from any of the panel um, on how, what kind, how, how it's affecting your business? Advice to anybody on what they should be doing with the complexity of this testing? 
Uh, I'll, I'll certainly say that it, it has changed a lot of the traveler behavior around it because of these testing parameters. Uh, we are seeing, on average, twice as many points of contact for every single booking that it used to be the case versus 2019 numbers. So twice as many phone calls for every transaction, twice as many emails, twice as many chats, just because of the continual education process for people to remember how to travel in addition to traveling in this new environment. So obviously, a lot of it comes back, back to retraining um, our staff and also resetting expectations for travelers themselves. Good. One thing I'd like to add is, is the fact that there is one really cool part, and maybe it's, you know, it's not for everybody's business model, but there is one really good part about being a travel advisor. You actually don't have to do business with everybody. <laughs> so you know, you're an advisor, you have four assets. You have your knowledge, you have your contacts, you have your time, and you have your life energy. And the reality is, is if you're a travel advisor, or you're an, even if you have a team and you have people on staff, the reality is, is, you know, we have been working for years telling the consumer and everybody the value of what we have to offer. But if somebody doesn't value it, you don't have to actually, you don't actually have to serve them. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but I just mean that at the end of the day, we have to value ourselves and we value what we do. Um, and I do think that one of the things that's happened during the pandemic is people either got nicer or not nicer. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Uh, life, your life energy, you've got to protect it or why do it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Why don't I get to our last question, which is in 30 seconds or less. I know that'll be difficult for me. Um, what's the biggest challenge that lies ahead this travel season and what's the biggest opportunity? And Mark, I'm gonna start with you since you keep complaining about being after math. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is, for us is it continues to be staffing. Um, we, we are really uh, searching high and low to find people in every single possible market to uh, being, bring into it. The biggest opportunity is we are absolutely seeing a resurgence of inquiry of people wanting to re-engage with travel as a career profession. Um, and that is, for me, extraordinary. Uh, our, we're seeing our average traveler decrease in average age themselves. Historically, we were at 44. We're now at 40. So we're seeing that there's a new bound interest, not just from a client perspective, but also from an employee perspective into this industry that we provide. And uh, for me, uh, that's, that's a wonderful trend line to come out of the, the pandemic. I'm going to see if I time myself. This is a heck of a challenge for me. 30 seconds. I, I got you, buddy. All right, got, got it? Okay. Yeah, let's so, go. Uh, greatest challenge is the staffing part, but I do think that there's an opportunity there. Left brain, right brain. We had 20 years, 1977 and 97, where primary was left brain. Now it's right brain. How do you mix those two types of brains together? Uh, and the other biggest opportunity for me, I want to say what Eric said, was is sustainability. Um, you know, everybody, the number of advisors that have said that they are want, that people aren't asking for sustainability, this is a huge opportunity for advisors. If you can do a great experience with somebody and make it easy for them to give their money to people doing cool things, you will be viewed at a higher level by that customer. It's probably 45. Uh, 50, but I'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Kareem, you now have three seconds. Okay. <laughs> Greatest challenge, managing expectation. So as advisors being very transparent, this is how it is. These are the challenges you're gonna face. This is what you can anticipate. Uh, but also greatest opportunity, exceeding expectations. So there are opportunities. There are ways to pace trips. There are ways to rethink trips. And there's still ways to deliver exceptional service and to direct our clients to places that will do that as well. Thank you. Eric. Yeah, it's difficult not to repeat. Um, yeah. Sustainability, there are two key words in Europe uh, today. It's yeah. sustainability and digital. Um, so uh, digital is more about the way we are selling and organizing the work for the customers. And uh, we just had the discussion on metaverse, for instance, trying to look ahead. So how to manage the, the rhythm of change of all these digital, digital tools is really a challenge for many companies. Um, and sustainability is just, as you, as you mentioned, this mm -hmm. is something very important uh, for the Euro European uh, customers. And uh, you see that 50% um, of the wording we have in meetings in Brussels or in Europe, not only in Brussels actually, that's the change with the COVID, mm -hmm. is about sustainable tourism. So um, I think that's, um, that, that's opening a lot of opportunities for this industry. That's wonderful. Catherine. 
It is difficult sitting here at the end um, trying to not repeat, but um, I have to agree. Um, and I, I would go right to what Kareem mentioned, and it is managing that expectation. Um, you know, we look at where we're sending, what you're sending your clients, and, you know, everything is still not 100%. Um, and the expectation is they're paying the money and they expect it to be. Things are still closed. Museums are still closed. Um, they need to understand that before they go. And the greatest opportunity, you know, John had it up on the board. You know, there's 43% of um, world looking to use a travel advisor. So there's 57 that um, is still out there um, that's not using a travel advisor. So there's a great opportunity for that business. Fantastic. Well, thank you for your time today. I'm going to ask the panel to please stay and have Erica come back to the stage. I know we have some pressing questions from all of you, and I believe we have some that have been streaming in. Is that yeah. correct? Well, let's give the panel a round of applause. <laughs>
I think uh, everything has been said. So that the, 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 the no crystal ball about the inflation. This is a real, a real question. Uh, on the other hand, we don't know what will be the, the future. I mean, there's so many unknowns in this in this today uh, about um, the next 24 months. I would say so that um, we need to see. And as uh, you just mentioned, the, the market is not fully reopened. So if it's not uh, domestic demand, then we may have. Uh, international demand that uh, that will help uh, sustain this uh, this growth there's always a way to work with budgets if the clients are flexible so on every trip is different and from one week to the next there can be more than a 50 percent difference in rate and so if the clients are flexible and they're clear on what their budget is there's a way to make it work we found always and in in terms of the airlines we just have to continue to communicate better um, as advisors we know the routes, we know the lift, we know the value of taking direct flights when it's more uh, conducive to drive to a destination to get a direct. So there are all those things where with good communication we can really help to uh, help our clients navigate best. The other thing that I'll, I'll add to that then is plan ahead, have a strategy and a framework that you work with. I've always said if travel advisors tell people that they're in the business of booking travel, they've literally lost before they even started because that's the I mean, that's just one teeny little piece. Um, and the other would be that I think one of the best things that ever happened to our industry uh, is that remember the days when everybody would try to start with a huge price up front and then drop their prices at the last minute? So I've got to give kudos to the uh, cruise line industry and other industries that kind of learned their lessons a little bit and actually did the other way around where the best prices were in the beginning and then they got more expensive. So I think that that's something that we also need to, to communicate to uh, consumers. Uh, the only other things to add towards that is we definitely have seen people who are traveling still, but just traveling for less amount of time. So mm -hmm. the average trip for some of ours was 10 days, now it's nine days. So that does have a, a net reduction towards it. We have actually seen a significant decrease for those who were traveling last year who bought very high of the market, who are now just stepping down a, a point or two on the scales for it. So there's ways that people make their budgetary cho choices. Mm -hmm. To your second question, James, um, there's been uh, lots of con uh, constructive dialogue with an industry around Omnichannel. Um, and it's time for that to become a reality. Airlines need to work closer with their TMC partners. This question is for, for Eric and, and Matthew and Mark. So the first part of the question I'm combining two here, how can and, and what areas uh, can ASTA and ECTA work together to promote travel in both regions? And then what steps can travel agencies take to promote sustainability? Because that's a topic that's come up quite a bit. So uh, Eric, we'll start with you, and then anyone else who can weigh in on sustainability, Mark Castro and Matthew, that, that would be great. Well, um, first, um, getting better acquainted, know each other, and the priorities of the organization um, is important. Um, understand how things are functioning in different areas, because European Union and US uh, governments are completely different. Um, the, I think, in my understanding, it's not only um, ECTA and ASTA working together, but we are part with um, working with Mark in the World Association, the Global Association of W3AAA, where we, I think, need also to further um, cooperate uh, on, on actions, real actions, promoting uh, travel. The only thing is that it comes on top of our daily business. And uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to have globally um, people joining on the same issues with the same ideas and, um, and doing the same activities. So uh, difficult to reply, but um, the will is here. And um, happy and to- And you're here. And, yeah, <laughs> happy and happy to, um, to continue on this direction, definitely. And uh, Matthew and, and Mark, if you'd care to weigh in on what steps travel agencies can take to promote sustainability. No, 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 man. <laughs> You're on a roll, man. Well, this is, a, this is near and dear. I mean, we started focusing on it 15 years ago. Um, and I think that, first of all, a couple of things that are really important. The, one of the problems with the word is the word itself, right? There's a lot of people, when you say sustainability, they only think about uh, environment. The reality is there's, there's the environment, there's, there's local, um, basically, employment, right, local economies, and there's preservation of natural cultural heritage. So I think it's important. So certainly the pandemic put a spotlight on sustainability, meaning literally the 65, 69 million people that lost their jobs 
and in places like Africa where we literally saw starvation. So we connecting it to places like that. So I think it's important. But I do come back to this whole thing about the fact that, you know, as far as the travel advisor perspective, I think one of the biggest problems we always have with, with the, being a travel advisor in general is that you want to be the expert. You want to, and there's, you know, we had Brene Brown as a speaker many years ago, and it's with the power of vulnerability, right? Um, and the fact that it's okay to not know everything. It, the fact that you even bring up sustainability and you may not, and you're always afraid of that one, oh great, I'm going to bring it up and they're going to be a PhD in environmental science, <laughs> God knows, whatever. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Learn what you can, work with our partners, tell better stories. Really, that's what it comes down to. And the reason that I remember somebody, uh, there were a bunch of um, young advisors at an event, and the question was asked, why do you, you know, are people asking for sustainable travel? And they, were saying, they were saying no, and I said, it's a question of leadership. And this is where I... This is a real statement from a real luxury client. If you can make sure that my family and I have a great, are gonna have a great experience and make it easy for me to know that I'm giving my money to somebody that's doing something really cool for their community, whatever, I will see you as the advisor at a different level of value in my life than I would somebody else. That's the opportunity. Very well said. Uh, so, so I also sit as the, the chair of ASTA uh, for, for the presence and greatly honored to have that as, as a position. Um, when doing so, I, I'd set three primary pro, um, missions for us. First, 20,000 members by 2025. Second was for us to expand our relationship with our partner organizations abroad, including ECTA. So it's ecstatic right. to have uh, um, Eric here. Uh, as we have learned, what happens in Brussels impacts us in the United States. What happens in the Caribbean impacts us with the United States. We really have to broaden our advocacy reach in those different areas, and this is definitely part of that partnership. And the third is to create a path for us as an industry to achieve net, uh, net zero by 2030. Part of that is recognizing that we are players in this space. Part of that is recognizing our clients are looking for answers from us in this space. They may not know how to ask the question, though. And exactly as Matthew said, is it's okay to come with the vulnerability of it, but at least recognize that that's part of it. So from an ASA standpoint, we have been offsetting all of our meetings. Uh, we took that preemptively on our own. We've been providing multiple uh, different education tracks within the organization to educate our membership on how to have those engagements and how to have those conversations with corporate travelers, with leisure travelers. And we'll be um, in, uh, providing more feedback directly to our suppliers around this space to ensure that they are working in tandem with us towards that side. So uh, I actually have a question from uh, someone who works at a romantic destination magazine. She wants to know how to reach and sell the next generation of traveler. If they're just booking online and, and not with an advisor, how do you reach them? And I think that we can combine that starting with Catherine and then Kareem with this other question about how do travel advisors promote their value? So uh, Catherine, do you want to start? How do travel advisors promote their value? And um, reaching the next generation who might just be booking the next online. Generation. Um, it's been difficult. It has definitely been difficult for the, for the industry. Um, you know, the next generation, um, we've seen it time and time again. They have turned to the big boxes and they're looking to do it yourself. Um, advisors today need to get out there and they need to show their value. They need to show um, that it's not so easy to, to do it on your own, um, that building out these experiences takes an expert. Um, give it to those that have, have lived it and that are traveling the world, that understand the locations that they're going to and that can give you in depth. Um, we are seeing it, the millennials, the Gen Xers are turning more to the travel advisor today um, because they're busy, they've got the discretionary cash, they don't wanna do it. Um, so we're seeing it open up um, more and more. Kareem? I think you have to be out in your local community as much as possible. So this next generation is very active. They're out, they're volunteering, they're doing things. And mm -hmm. if you're active in your community, you're going to meet them naturally. Um, and once you meet them, you really have to communicate what you do and why it's important and why it's of value and really engage them in dialogue. So uh, for instance, I have a, a neighbor now that's planning a honeymoon. They're both in their, in their 20s. And maybe they'll work with me. Maybe they'll do things on their own, but it's a dialogue that we've started about this is what I do, this is how I can assist. And I think the more we're just visible and out there communicating what we do, speaking to our local media, uh, speaking to the parents, to the grandparents, 
that's how we're going to get to the next generation. And then once we work with them and they see the value, the, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, once they work with an advisor, they're, they're not going to go back. Can I, I, can I add, yeah, please add, because no, was, we're running right out of time, but I think this no, is a great place for everybody to wrap this up. Yeah. 2004, I was asked that question, and I remember thinking, and I said, by creating the next generation of advisors. And during the pandemic, if you were to ask me what is the one thing I'm proudest that our organization has done over the last 20 years, is the amount of new talent we brought into the industry. Young people and career switchers. And it's been a huge, huge part of what it. But there's one other thing. I always like to recommend books. Read Wisdom at Work by Chip Conley. He was the, the, the guy that, that started Joie de Vivre Hotels, went to work for Brian Chesky at Airbnb, and he wrote the book about the making of the modern elder, what it was like to be a 55-year-old working for a 25-year-old CEO at a company where everybody was half his age. And I think that's one of the coolest things that's happening right now in, in society is that mentorship used to be mm -hmm. the older person telling the younger person what to do, you know, et cetera. That's not, it's a two-way street now. There is such a huge opportunity right now of young people and older people have a different mentality. And he created the, the, the word mentor, half mentor, half intern. Anyone else, please add, because we, we are running out of time here, uh, but we will answer the questions that have come through. We'll make sure that we get to everybody. I see a lot of them here. Uh, but I think that this is a great place to have everybody just finish weighing in with, with this important topic. Erica, the only thing I would add is technology tools. You need to speak to the next generation like they like to be spoken to. So the methods that maybe we used 10 years ago don't work today. Invest in your businesses, have chat systems, use the proper digital format that works for communication with these individuals, and you will see your business flourish because they just figured out we were here, <laughs> and now we need to communicate on their terms. Mark? I, I can add one more to it. Uh, I was meeting with one of our independent contractors last week. She started her business three years ago. Not the best timing. Uh, young, uh, young mother of two. Uh, she's uh, young 30s. And uh, she last month closed on uh, $70,000 in commission from her bookings. What she's done, I was asking her, well, what did you do differently? What's, what's unique? And she said, all my business is coming through Better Door. I'm just become the travel agent for the neighborhood. And so I'm just engaging with my, my peeps in that environment. Like, well, why, why won't we do more of that? It's just a perfect venue. So I guess poor part of it is obviously you go where the client is. Mm -hmm. You location, 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 it's gonna be a different location. Great, well, we are out of time right now. Uh, we're on a strict timeline here, but thank you to everyone. Let's give everyone a round of applause because this is a great discussion. Thank you all for being here. We'll email the presentation to those who asked for it and we will get to all of the questions uh, after our program wraps up. Uh, tomorrow. So thank you all for, for joining us in person as well. And we'll look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. Thank you.